Thanks for joining us today. We'd love to hear how God is using this ministry in your life. So we encourage you to share your story with us at info at fellowshipgj.com or by clicking the Share Your Story tab on the Church Center app. Also, if God is using this ministry to impact you, we want to encourage you to partner with us financially. You can do that by clicking on the giving link located on the description below this video, online at fellowshipgj.com, or if you're a member here at Fellowship Church, you can give through our Church Center app. This will help us to continue to bring the message of Jesus Christ to our community and beyond. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoy today's service. Well, good morning, church family. How are you today? Let's stand to our feet as we give God all the praise that he deserves here in his house this morning. Come on.
Christmas season to all of you. We're so glad to see you all here. And you know, talking to some of you before the service, I felt that you're here, 11 o'clock service, you're energetic, which that's unusual this time of year because most people are tired. So congratulations for that. Seems like you're awake and ready to go. I heard about a woman who wanted to check on her friend, called her up on the phone. And when she answered, she said, hey, how you doing? And her friend said, oh, I'm so tired. The house is filthy, hadn't cleaned it in two weeks. The clothes are backed up. The kids are hungry. The kitchen's a mess. And I don't even feel like going in there and making them anything to eat. I'm that tired. And her friend said, well, listen, I'm going to come over there right now. I'm going to fix the kids something to eat. I'm going to clean up your entire house. I'm going to do all your laundry. And I will babysit them until your husband, Bob, gets home. And the woman paused a minute and said, wait a second. I don't have a husband named Bob. And the woman that called her said, oh, no. Is this not Sarah? And she said, no, my name's Jill. There's a long pause. And then Jill said, uh, wait, you're still coming over though, right? <laughs> you ever been that tired where you just take help from anybody, anybody that offers? Well, thank you so much for being here today. And I want to pray a prayer of blessing over your life, asking God to bless you through this season, right on out of this year, bring into a brand new year that we are so, so excited about. But let and you guys receive this as I pray over you. Okay, Father God, we love you so much and thank you for loving us. Thank you for so easily forgiving us of our sins and forgiving us for moods we get in, things we say we shouldn't say. Thank you for not being mad at us. Thank you that when we tell you we messed up and what we did, you already know about it and you so easily treat us like we never did anything wrong. What an amazing relationship we can have with you, Father. And thank you for that all coming through your son, Jesus. Thank you. We love him. love him so much. So, Father, I ask right now that you bless every person in this room. I pray you bless them with wonderful health. I pray, Father, that none of their, them or their loved ones would get sick, whether they're in this room or they're watching from, from online at home. If they get a cold or they get a virus or something, that we would all kick out of that real quickly, not have to stretch it out, feel bad for a long time, nobody having to go into the hospital for it. But I pray for health. I pray for safety, blessings. 
Uh, Father, you said abundant blessings on your kids, and I pray that, Father, we would all be on the receiving end of all those wonderful things you offer us. And, Father, we just want to let you know how much we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Wave at somebody, and you can make your way to your seats. And, again, thank you so much. Those of you that are watching from home and online, thank you for tuning in with us. We know you've got a lot of choices there uh, on Facebook or on uh, YouTube. Uh, to live stream with on Sundays, and thank you so much for tuning in here, and thank those of you that are sharing uh, a subscription or sharing the uh, YouTube uh, service with uh, a loved one that's in another city or in another state. We hear back from a lot of people from a long distance away, and uh, thanks for letting us minister to your loved ones and families by sharing uh, sharing these services. We're so glad you're here. Now, guys, I got to ask you that are a part of the 11 o'clock service for a tremendous favor, and that is after our Christmas Eve services Friday afternoon, uh, this, the next Sunday, a week from today, we are only going to have one unified service. We're doing that for our workers, our staff, and everyone that has worked so hard uh, going into the season. So one unified service next Sunday. That's the good news. The bad news is, is at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. I know it. I know. You guys love to sleep in, get your pancakes, you know, kick out of your pajamas, you know, a few minutes before you head out the door. But listen, next Sunday, push it because it will be so worth it for you to spend the last Sunday of 2021 here in the house of God. It is going to be amazing. It is going to be a great service, and you're going to love Christmas Eve as well. Christmas Eve, 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock here at the church, and please, please bring your friends. Christmas and Easter are a perfect time to invite somebody that doesn't normally come to church. The service we planned is going to be wonderful. They will leave here very encouraged. They'll leave here smiling and so glad that they've come. So invite them to a 3 o'clock service or a 5 o'clock service this next Friday evening. Now, in order to do that and to help you do that, we have guest cards or invite cards is what we call them. These are at the information center. So pick yourself up a stack of them, give them to a coworker, put them, give them to a waitress that you go, you might know, or give them to somebody to remind them, yes, it is three and five o'clock, and, and that will be, that'll just be wonderful. Just help us out with that. We'd appreciate it. Please pick these up. There's a bunch of them at the Information Center, and if you are a guest today, you're not normally, a, you don't normally come to Fellowship Church, but you've come with a friend today, we would love to give you a gift bag that is also at the Information Center, and there you can also have a coupon that'll give you one of the specialty drinks from our wonderful coffee shop uh, in the lobby. We are so, so glad you guys are here. Enjoy this service. Pastor J.L., struggling with her voice a little bit this morning, called me real, real early and said, I'm struggling. I can't hardly talk. I said, suck it up and get in there and do your job. You know, I was, I was compassionate. <laughs> I was, <laughs> but women are tougher than us men anyway. I'd be home and in bed if I were her, but you're going to love the message today. Hey, this is a lot of fun. Enjoy what you're about to see. An angel came to see Mary. She was doing laundry, and then the angel just appeared, and she was really scared. So Gabriel was like, Mary, you're going to have, what? I can't, I can't say good. Mary, you're going to have a baby. I, you're going to have a baby, and you will call him Jesus. And then Mary was like, I'm not going to have a baby yet. I'm only a teenager. I'm not married. Then the angel Gabriel told Joseph that Mary is not lying. She, you are having a new baby. And so they met up. They went to Bethlehem. Ham, which was Joseph's old town. They ride a donkey. <laughs> I don't know. A camel. Oh, yeah, a camel. She said, this donkey's fast. Well, they tried to go to a hotel, and they asked the keeper um, for a place to stay. The keeper said, we have no rooms. Literally, no rooms. <laughs> so Mary and Joseph walked away sadly, but then he said, the only place and here in Bethlehem, him that that you can stay stay is a staple. And then he just pointed the way, and they followed. When the shepherds were taking care of the sheep, and then they saw angels. The angel said, "A new baby is get, getting born, who is king of the Jews." 
the angel were singing. Glorious. And then the shepherd said, I think we should go there and meet him. The second, I think, said, yeah, I agree with you. And the other said, yeah, me too. They had to walk through a bunch of grass and bushes, maybe have to camp out a night. And then the wise men heard about it. And then a star appeared. We should probably follow that star. It's pointing down to the barn. So maybe we should follow it. Maybe. So the wise men went to Jesus. They gave them gifts. A stuffed animal, like a hippo one, to have at home. Some diapers, and yeah. some wipes, and some milk, <laughs> some shoes, some Jordans. Gold, Frank, and Latimer. And I don't know how it would survive in that barn. Too stinky, too crowded, and ugh. I think he probably pooped because the room was very smelly. Thank you for coming. He's adorable. He's gonna be our best friend. I love you, and you're the best baby I ever seen. There, I said it. <laughs> the new baby is gonna change the world. So this Christmas, as we gather around the manger and we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we have to think deeper than just what we see initially. Is it just a baby in the manger or is it something bigger than that? And I gotta be honest, I love babies. I think they're adorable. Sometimes when my job's a little slow, I sneak over to the nursery and I go in there and I hold your all's sweet little babies and I love to snuggle them they come up close to my chest. I love sniff their heads. It's such a great, just the head, not the other ends. But like, they smell awesome and they're so cool and so gentle and such a beautiful. And if you can get a baby to giggle, it's like the best sound in the universe. And so I love babies. But if I had an emergency, if I had a crisis, if I needed help, I would never call for a baby. I would never call for a baby to come to my rescue, and yet God chose to make his appearance on this planet as a baby. Jesus the Son existed in heaven before the creation of the world, and before Christmas, he was already there, and he wasn't hanging out in heaven in baby form. Excuse me, I need to, I'm hoping to stop smoking in 2022. The Bible says in John, in John chapter one, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. In him was life and that life was the light of mankind. When the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This lets us know that Jesus, the son, chose to make his appearance on this planet. But before he did, he already existed and not in baby form. He existed in heaven and he came as a baby because that was the plan. Hebrews 4 tells us that God wanted us to have a high priest that could identify with our weakness, who could understand human frailty, that would know temptation and struggle and yet be without sin. And so before the creation of the world, God the Father and Jesus the Son already decided on the plan. In 1 Peter 1, it says, God chose him as your ransom before the world began. That means before the creation of the world, before the garden, before Adam and Eve, before the apple, before the first sin, God already knew all of that was gonna happen. That Adam, would pluck, Adam and Eve would pluck the apple, they'd eat the apple, and that sin would come into the world and humanity would be separated from him. He knew it, and yet he still chose to create us knowing that he himself would have to come to redeem us. He knew it, and he still desired relationship with us. He still wanted to be with us so much so that he created humanity knowing he was the plan for redemption. Now, he knew that I would need a savior, and he had already decided he's not gonna staff it out to an angel. 
He's not gonna hope that I can pull it off by living a really good life. He knew already that he himself would be the one that would come. That was the plan from the beginning of time. And throughout human history, God revealed hints towards this plan through the Old Testament, saying my son is gonna come. And he wanted us to be able to identify him when he arrived. And so 700 years before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah made a prediction, and it's recorded in the scriptures, to hint to us, to show us what the Messiah would be like. Here's what it says, Isaiah 7, it says, the Lord himself will provide you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so God was trying to get us to know that he was coming, that he intended to rescue, he intended to save, he intended to come after us. Again, a prophet almost 700 years before Jesus was born named Micah, Micah made a prediction and he predicted where the Messiah would have to be born. It says in Micah chapter five, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, only a small village among the people of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from that of old, from everlasting. So Micah is predicting that the Messiah, the Christ, the savior of the world must be born in the city of Bethlehem because God was trying to communicate to his people, I'm coming, I'm coming, salvation is coming. But some people get hung up on this question. They ask themselves, how do I know of all the babies ever born, how do I know that Jesus is the baby? How do I know that Jesus is the son of God and that it's not like George or something over there? How do we know? And that's where those predictions come into play. Like someone did the research, his name is Dr. Peter Stoner, statistical probability of certain prophecies being true of someone that wasn't the son of God. So what is the statistical probability of a human being being born in the city of Bethlehem? It's one in 300 million. One in 300 million babies could be born there and they don't necessarily have to be the Messiah. So he thought, I need to do additional research, additional statistical study to figure out what is the possibility of one man fulfilling more of those prophecies without being the Messiah? And so he set about with his colleague, Dr. Newman, and they made the decision to try to figure out what is the statistical probability of eight prophecies being true of someone from the beginning of time until current day, someone fulfilling them but not being the Messiah. What is that? And so they did math and they came to the conclusion that it was one in 10 to the 17th power of fulfilling eight of the major prophecies about being the Christ. One in 10 to the 17th power. So that's a one followed by 17 zeros for those of us who aren't that good at math. One was 17 zeros. So what does that really look like? It looks like this. Imagine that you are gonna be in a raffle. And so I tell you, your chances are one in 10. I would take 10 tickets, I'd mark one ticket, I put all 10 tickets in a hat, shake it up, you reach in, you draw out the ticket with the X. What is that statistical probability? One in 10, right? One in 10. So to get one in 10 to the 17th power, you would have to take, it's like imagine a silver dollar. Okay, and you would cover the ground with these silver dollars to get one in 10 to the 17th power, you would have to cover the entire state of Texas in silver dollars, two feet deep. And then one of those silver dollars would be marked with the red X and the whole state of Texas and all its silver dollars would be like stirred up and everything. And then I would blindfold you and I would say, go find the one silver dollar with the X. That's the statistical probability of one in 10 to the 17th power. And Dr. Stoner and Dr. Newman concluded that the chances of any one human fulfilling eight of the prophecies about being the Messiah would be one in 10 to the 17th power. Now, how many prophecies are there in the Old Testament for the Messiah to have to fill? 60, and Jesus fulfilled them all. 60 major prophecies. There's an additional 270 minor prophecies that the Messiah would have to fulfill, and Jesus fulfilled all of those as well. So what is the statistical chance 
of a man that wasn't the Messiah being able to fulfill those prophecies. Astronomical. And here's another thing. One of the prophecies was that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Can a baby make his mother give birth in a certain city? Of course not. Could, could the baby make his mother give birth in a city from which he, they did not live? You can't control that. Or for Jesus to have been, one of the prophecies had to be that he had to be executed by crucifixion. And that was predicted before the Romans invented crucifixion. And one of the prophecies is that after his death on the cross, that the soldiers would gamble and roll dice for his clothing. And that came to pass as well. You can't manipulate someone rolling dice for your clothes after you're, you've died. So unless Jesus is the Messiah, there's no way that he could have fulfilled all of these prophecies. And so we learn that God has a plan. He has a plan. And when he has a plan, he'll make it come to pass. It's more than just, God is filled with more than just good intentions. God has good follow through. He planned for Jesus to come for thousands of years, and then he brought that plan to pass. And God has a plan for you too. He has a plan for your life. He doesn't just have good intentions for your life. He has an actual plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you future and a hope. And even if God would have to suspend the laws of nature for his plan for you to come to pass, he will do it. If you're standing up against the Red Sea, he'll part it. If you're staring down the walls of Jericho, he'll cause them to fall. If you're eyeball to eyeball with your Goliath, God can help you slay him. No matter what it is that you're facing, if God has a plan for your life, and Jeremiah 29, 11 says that he does, God's plan for your life will come to pass, and there's no one and no thing that can stop it. That doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. In fact, most Jesus has warned us. He says, in this life, you will have troubles, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So we're going to go out, and we're going to start executing God's plan in our life, and we're going to get into some difficult positions. And the Bible tells us when that happens, that we have Emmanuel. We have God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. That's what we sing about at Christmas. The fact that God is actually with us. I'm so glad that God didn't just intend to send Jesus, but he actually did send Jesus. We don't, we can't just have good intentions in this life. We have to actually have good follow through because we don't benefit from the prayers we intend to pray. We benefit from the prayers we actually pray. We don't benefit from the businesses we intend to start. We benefit from the business we actually do start. We don't benefit from the conversations we intend to have. We benefit from the conversations we actually have. We don't benefit from the memories we intend to make with our kids. We benefit from the memories we actually make. And so this Christmas, we celebrate a God who loves us so much that he laid down his royal robes of divinity, who stepped into humanity, who was born of a virgin in a town called Bethlehem in the royal line lineage of King David. And we gather around a manger and we look at a baby. And when we do, I'm so glad that there's more than a baby in that manger. I'm so glad because I need more than just a baby. A baby isn't gonna be enough. I need Jesus. I need Jesus because there's no other name under heaven or earth that a man can call on and be saved. And I need a savior to call on. There's more than just a baby in the manger. There's a savior. There's a savior in the manger. That's what I need. I need a savior. I need my slate washed clean. I remember being 15, 14 years of age, the fall of my freshman year of high school, and I felt the weight of my sin. I felt the pressure of the mistakes that I had made. I could tell that I wasn't measuring up. I was fully aware that God was perfect and flawless and never made errors, and then there was me, and I looked at my life, and I knew I wasn't meeting the standard, and I felt 
the shame and the frustration that went with that. And I did what I was taught. What I was taught was to try to do more good than bad, that my good would somehow outweigh my bad, or that when I messed up that I should punish myself by doing religious things to like make up for it. And so I, I was kind of living my life that way. And when I was in a church service and I first heard that Jesus was the savior and that he willingly took upon his back the weight of my sins, that he carried the cross, that I could have forgiveness and it wasn't gonna be about what I could do or how good or how many righteous acts I could commit to overcome my sins, but that God would just forgive them, I was shocked. I had never heard that before. And the pastor was explaining that and he gave people an opportunity to make that decision to follow Christ. And he asked people in the church, like, raise your hand if you're making this commitment. And I was sitting there in that service and I wanted, I wish I could tell you I did raise my hand, but I did not. Because I was so weighed down by shame and guilt and thinking that I was not worthy. And my friends next to me, they did raise their hand. And as soon as they prayed that prayer, I could tell the weight was off of them, that they, something supernatural had taken place. And so I went home after church that night and I laid in my bed and I was just overcome with just guilt for the things that I had done. And in my own way, as a freshman in high school, I uttered a prayer the best I could, acknowledging that I had messed up and that I needed Jesus' forgiveness, just like my friends and and I believed what the pastor had said, but I was just afraid to ask God to forgive me of my sins. And I prayed that prayer. And guys, my life has never been the same because I need a fresh start. I need more than a baby in the manger. I need forgiveness and I need to do over. And that's one of the things that Jesus provides for us by coming. Isaiah chapter one, verse 18 says this. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. There's more than a baby in the manger. There's a fresh start in the manger. There's forgiveness in the manger. I need more than a good teacher to instruct me about righteousness. I need a savior to help me when I am not right. I need more than someone to tell me what I ought to do. I need someone to help me when I know what I ought to do, but I'm also not doing it. And Romans 5, 8 tells me that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. And so no matter who we are and no matter what we have done, we can call out to Jesus and be saved. That's part of the Christmas miracle that there is a savior in the manger. The Bible also says there's power in the manger. There's power in the manger. And what separates Jesus from any other religious figure ever born in human history is that he was already great at his birth. He didn't have to do anything, accomplish anything. He already was. The Bible says Jesus is the resurrection and the life. The Bible says Jesus is the hope of the world. He is the light in the darkness. Jesus isn't just a baby like another religious figure that will hopefully grow up and say some profound things. He is God himself. And so when we look into the manger, we see not just a baby, but we see humanity combined with divinity, that he's 100% God and 100% human all at the same time. And I need more than a good teacher that can teach me ideas or principles or three steps to a better life. I need someone who can empower me. And when I look in the manger, I see that Jesus is the power that I need in my life. He doesn't just say, love your enemies. He empowers me to love them. He doesn't just say, forgive the people who've wronged you. He gives you the strength to actually forgive the people. He doesn't just teach us to serve others. He anoints us to do that serving. He doesn't just inform us on religious facts and historical data. He infuses us with wisdom. And that's the beauty of the second truth is that there is power in the manger. And number three, there is hope. There's hope in the manger. Hope is the confident expectation. I'm looking forward to something that's gonna happen. I'm expectant. Like Mary, I'm pregnant with hope. Ordinary hope, as we express, is when we're expecting something, but there's 
some uncertainty. So for example, ordinary hope would be, I'm hoping my teenager will clean their room while I am at work today. I'm hoping for it, but I'm not holding my breath. I'm hoping it will happen, but I'm not really counting on it. It would kind of be a miracle if it came to pass. I'm hoping they'll do it, but nobody really believes they will, right? I'm hoping, but biblical hope is not like that. Biblical hope has an element of certainty. It's more than wishful thinking. It's more like, more than just a strong desire. Like, I wish my teenager will clean the room. I wish the Broncos will win. It's like a true, resolute expectancy, a confidence that what you're thinking for or hoping for will actually happen. When I was in my senior year of Bible college, I ran into a wall. I had come the summer before here to Grand Junction and I interned, and I loved this place. I fell in love with Grand Junction. I fell in love with Fellowship Church. I knew in my heart that it was God's plan that I come back to this church. And I went back to college because I had one more year to finish, and I was now in my very final semester. And Pastor Tim and Pastor Hooper had offered me a job, and I knew that I wanted to take this job as soon as I could. And when I went to sign up for the classes I need to, to graduate that spring, and I looked at the money in my checkbook, I realized I was about one class worth of money short from what I needed to be able to pay for that final semester. But I had hoped, I expected, I was confident that God had called me here to Grand Junction. I needed to get here, not take a whole nother semester just to finish this one class. So I prayed about it and I felt God tell me to put my hope in him. And so I signed up for the class that I did not have the money to pay for. It wasn't due for a couple months, and I had no idea how I was going to come up with the money, so I just hoped the confident expectation that somehow God would provide. And I thought to myself, how is this going to unfold? Where is this money going to come from? And I thought, well, maybe like Wells Fargo will make a bank error in my favor, right? And I'm going to get the 600 and some odd dollars that I need. Or maybe the university computer that keeps track of tuition will malfunction from someone's baseball bat for not mine but some somehow that the computer would break and and they, I would be recorded as paid in full I didn't know but I knew that I had to take this class and I knew I had to come and I was hoping that God would come through every week I went to my job I worked at Walgreens pharmacy and I went to my job each week and I did what I do and I got my minimum wage paycheck and it was never going to be enough to pay my bills and to make up that 600 and some odd dollars one particular day, a man came into the store, and I could tell right away that he was homeless. And I approached him, and I helped him find a few things that he needed around the store, and gathered him in his basket, and then there was a long line. And so I opened another register, and I checked the man out. And as I was doing it, he said to me, you are really kind. You are really kind, so I'm going to give you a scholarship. And I said, no, that's okay, man. Keep your money. I, I, I don't want to take any money from you because I could tell the man was like struggling to eat. And so he pulled out of his pocket a massive pile of bills, just huge bills, but they looked like Monopoly money, just fake. And so I was like, okay, you know, there's something a little bit off. So I just said, you're so kind. Thank you so much. I don't, I don't want to take anything from you. I don't, need, I don't need a scholarship. And he took the money and he handed me a bill and he's like, just keep it. I want you to have it. I want you to be able to pay for school. And so I took the fake money. And I was like, thank you so much. You're so kind. He paid for his objects and he left the store. And I took my break a few minutes later and I looked at that money and I thought, it's, it's not real. But there was a Wells Fargo just down the street. And so on my break, I was like, I'm just gonna go and see what it is. Maybe it's cool, you know? So I go down there and they take the money. and like, oh yes, this is 10,000 uh, German marks. And I was like, oh, cool. What's that worth? And they said $682, which is pretty much what I needed to finish Bible college. So God knew my need. He knew that I was putting my hope in him. He knew that I had placed my confident expectation in him that somehow he was gonna come through with this miracle. I have no idea where this homeless person got their money or why they felt compelled to give their money to me other than hope. And when I look in the manger, I see hope in Jesus. And church family, I believe that God has sent us hope in the manger. 
Hope for a better job. Hope for that relationship. Hope for your kids. Hope for a vacation. Hope for the future. Hope for health. Hope for your family. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 6, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our soul. Hope for the believer is a strong and confident expectation. We are hoping for something. We're believing in it, that if it doesn't happen, we would actually be kind of surprised. There is hope in the manger. And number four, there is healing in the manger. The amazing thing about Christmas is this, that God knew when he sent Jesus his one and only son into the world. He knew that we would reject him as humanity. He knew that Christmas and Easter were gonna be tied together. He knew when he sent that baby in the manger that that Easter was coming, the crucifixion, that the weight of the sin of the world would be upon his back. He knew it and he still chose it. And so when we look in the manger, we're able to see that there is healing in the manger because Isaiah 53, five says, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. God gave us wholeness and God gave us healing in the manger. And so when my heart is broken and it's hurting in places that medicine cannot reach, there's healing in the manger. And when I'm, I'm stressed out and I'm overwhelmed and I'm frustrated because events have unfolded and I can't find closure to what's happened in my life, there's wholeness in the manger. I can receive wholeness because Jesus can provide closure that my mind doesn't have answers for. There's healing and there's wholeness as a result of Jesus being born in the manger. And so this Christmas, I challenge you, As you look at the manger, as you gather with your families around presents and tinsel and all of that stuff that's lights, everything that's a part of Christmas, I challenge you to look deeper into the manger, to look for a God who sent a savior, a God who gives hope, a God who gives healing, a God who gives power to live your life to the fullness. And don't just like glaze over Christmas. Don't just glaze over the manger, but press in. And ask God to show you the hope and the healing and the salvation and the power that he's given you through the manger, through Jesus' birth that we celebrate this Christmas. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you would love us so much that you would offer yourself for the salvation of mankind. That you would love us so much that you would choose to come and to be born so that you could provide healing and wholeness and power to us. We are so grateful this Christmas for everything that you brought to us in the manger, everything that you grew to be, everything that you revealed to us through your teaching. And God, we would not be the same people. We wouldn't be anything close to who we are if it wasn't for what you were willing to do all those years ago. We thank you for it. We celebrate it. We pray that this holiday season would just be filled with your presence, with your strength, with your anointing that you would infuse us with the wisdom that we need, the wholeness and the healing. And we give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, church family, we love you very much. We'll see you all on Christmas Eve at 3 and 5 p.m. Thanks for listening to this week's message at Fellowship Church. If you've not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that right now. The Bible says in the book of Romans, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And you can do that right now. I just wanna encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are Lord, that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again and God, I thank you for that. And I ask you now to be my savior, to guide my life, and to give me a home forever in heaven. And God, I ask you this in your precious son, Jesus' name, amen. 
If you just prayed this prayer for the first time, we would love to celebrate with you. Please text the word HEAVEN to 94000 to get in contact with our staff where we can answer any questions that you might have. And also, if you're in need of prayer, we'd love to support you. You can submit your prayer requests by texting PRAYER SUPPORT to 94000. Our prayer team will receive your request and immediately start covering you. If this was your first time experiencing Fellowship Church, or if you want to learn more about one of our many ministries here, text the word fellowship to 94000 to connect with our staff today. And as always, we are still just a phone call away. You can contact us at 970-245-PRAY with any questions. And thanks again. We hope to see you next week in person or online.